Good to see all of you this morning. It's good to see we have a lot of visitors with us, and thank you for being here. Uh, before we begin, I'd just like to express my thanks to everyone and their patience for the past couple of weeks uh, as I was getting my tonsils out. I'm glad so far that I did it. I feel better now than I did before I got them out. So I think it solved the problem. At least I'm hoping so. Uh, but I, I woke up feeling good this morning, and I told Jason last week, I'm like, Jason, I got to preach. And he's like, you itching for it, right? <laughs> and I was like, yeah, yeah, I got, I got to do something. I got to be useful in some way. You know? <laughs> but uh, thank you so much for all the cards and the visits and the food. And, uh, and I just really uh, felt very loved uh, for those past couple of weeks. And Emily did a great job keeping me alive, and I'm back. Uh, so thank you for that, and thank you for your patience, and, and let me heal up. What I'd like to talk about uh, this morning is asking a question I think a lot of us ask uh, often. And every year, you know, usually we'll get to a point where me and Jason will get six or seven questions all at once. And someone will ask uh, this question along the lines of, does the Lord want denominations? Or ask the question about, you know, Andrew, I have friends that are members of denominations. We had conversations together. Uh, what do I need to tell them? They ask this. I don't know what to say. Uh, certainly many even more so now people will ask, you know, I have friends that are part of multi-site churches. Uh, is there anything I can talk to them about that? They had this question, what do I answer? We get this all the time. So usually about once a year, we'll preach a sermon like this. And, and it always ends up kind of being a refresher course on what we believe, and most importantly, why we believe what we believe. And that I believe that we have authority to say the things that we're going to say this morning. And so we're going to ask the question and answer, answer the question, uh, does the Lord want denominations? Let's look at Ephesians 4, if you're not already there. We'll start there reading verse 1. It says, I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling which you were called, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Paul's here argument, especially going back to verse 3, that we should all be endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. And he says that makes sense that we would want to keep the unity of the Spirit. Why? Because there's only one Spirit. There's not multiple spirits, there's one. And there's also one body. There's one church. There's one baptism and there's one God. And so if there's this oneness that we see in God and also see in his church, certainly we should be a reflection of that. And we should all endeavor to keep the unity of the bond of peace. Well, as we begin this, let's first ask the question what the word denomination is in the first place. And I think that's a challenge because there's a lot of different, denom uh, there's a lot of different definitions for denominations. What is a denomination? Well, it's a small piece of a larger whole. And that's probably the best generic de a definition you can give because usually when we describe denominations, what do we use as an example? We use money, right? A $1 bill is a denomination of $100. That you would have one whole, and this would be a piece or a section of it. I've been looking for a very religious definition of what we, the world would perceive to be what denominations means. And the best definition that I found, believe it or not, was on Wikipedia. Whoever edited the Wikipedia page for denominations, I think gave a very good definition of what the world perceives denominations to be. A Christian denomination is a distinct religious body within Christianity, identified by traits such as a name, organization, leadership, and doctrine. And I thought those last four things were very important to understand what this is. That the thought is, is that you would have the Christian as a whole, the church as a whole, but you would have a distinct religious body within that whole. And they would be set apart by their leadership, by their beliefs, and by what they practice. And that's how you would be the exact different denomination, a distinct denomination. Sometimes what we see in denominations is they'll have a leadership that votes on the best way to practice God's word. And in a way, they become a middle man. That God would give the word, the middle man or the leadership would decide what God really means in his word. 
and they would give the instructions to everybody else. And so a denomination usually always depends on a middle man to be the leader of the people and be between the people and God. Uh, local churches under denominations are expected to obey, aren't they? You know, there's an expectation that if this denomination leadership says, this is what we believe, this is what we practice, the local churches that are belong to that denomination are expected to do those things. There's usually not a lot of freedom reserved when we see in the modern day denominations. And, and let me give an example. You know, the model that someone has written out to me when trying to explain to me why they agreed with a denominational thought for God's church is they drew a circle and they drew a whole bunch of different churches inside that circle. I'm going to reject this model at the end of this sermon. But what you can see here is the circle itself was the universal church, Christ's body. And they argued that it was made up of all the different local churches of all over the world. What a denomination is, is when a group of those churches gets together and they set themselves apart from the other groups in terms of their leadership and their organization and what they believe. What are they here? They're a small piece of a larger whole, right? And that's where I think where we can best see what denomination means to the world. They have signaled themselves out. What's very important to make yourself distinct from all the other local churches in the body of Christ is you've got to have a name. You've named yourself. And this is how we keep up with, I'm a part of this denomination because I'm a part of this name. Now let's give a very direct example. The United Methodist Church. And I'm going to use them as an example as we go through this uh, sermon. This is not an attempt to target or to mock the United Methodist Church. The reason why I'm going to use the United Methodist Church today is because it's the denomination that the majority of my family is part of. Many of my family members are ministers in the United Methodist Church. And that's because my great-great-grandfather was a pastor of the United Methodist Church in Springville. And he had a very long-lasting impact on my family in terms of what we believe. And a lot of my other relatives have followed in his footsteps in the minister and pastor work of the United Methodist Church. And let me tell you. I'm very grateful for the man and the character that my great-great-grandfather was. He left a very good leg legacy of goodness and wholesomeness and morality that my other great-grandfathers did not leave. My other great-grandfathers were thieves and drunkards and cheaters. And except for one, they all lived that life and died in that life. But this great-great-grandfather was a good man. And in terms of morality, I am grateful for the things that he has left in my family. But I do not agree with the principles of the United Methodist Church. And that is because I don't believe the Bible agrees with some of the beliefs of the United Methodist Church and denominationalism as a whole. But what I'd like to do is use them as an example in believing in myself that I am not being unfair or have an unfair bias. There's a lot of appreciation here for some of the people in my family that were raised in the United Methodist Church. If you remember, the United Methodist Church voted in 2019 on their position on homosexuality. That there was a gathering of a lot of their clergymen and they got together and they voted on what their church believes about homosexuality. And due to because of the Russian and African groups that came in and voted, they voted that God was right about homosexuality. Uh, that, that homosexuality was sinful and God was right about that. Well, when this has happened, if you remember, there were several United Methodist churches that were very upset that this vote happened. And when these churches disagreed with their vote in 2019, they attempted to leave the denomination. I know of one church in Birmingham that's very pro-homosexuality that is attempting right now to leave the United Methodist Church organization. I know of another Methodist church that is very conservative and is also trying to leave the United Methodist Church organization because of how quickly this vote almost went the other way. And maybe many of you know of people that are members of the Methodist Church that are currently actually trying to get out of the United Methodist Church organization. Do you know what happened when many of these churches decided they were no longer going to be Methodist? Do many of you remember? They discovered that the United Methodist Church organization owns all their church property. That it owns the building. It owns the property. 
And this is because in the 1790s, John Wesley set up a trust that local churches would take care of their local church. They would build their local church building. They would uh, care for the property of their local church building. But they would never actually own their local church building. And you know what this has given the United Methodist Church? A lot of control. Because, yeah, your church, you can decide to leave the Methodist belief system, but you can't take your church building or any of your resources with you. And that's discouraged a lot of people. And I think it's got a lot of people thinking maybe this denomination system is not what the Lord intended. Because as you can see, man has gripped in here and taken some control that it seems like God never gave man control of. And so what I'd like to do next is let's look at Jesus. Jesus was born into a religious world very much like ours, where Judaism was broken up into sects. Sex, very similar to denominations, is a section of a larger whole. Judaism was brought, broken into many different sects. The two we'll focus on is the Sadducees and the Pharisees. If you remember in Acts 5, that it says, When the high priest rose up and all those were with him, which is the sect of the Sadducees, and they were filled with indignation, and they fussed at the apostles there. As well in Acts 15, you see that some of the sect of the Pharisees who believed rose up, it is necessary to circumcise them and command them to keep the law of the Moses. That there were basically different sections of Judaism, and you would be a Jew, but you would follow one of these sects or one of these belief systems with different leaderships, but you would still call yourself a Jew. That is very similar to the denomination system that we have today. Everyone calls themselves Christians, but they really mean is, what denomination are you a part of? What do you believe as you as a Christian? What did Jesus do when he came into the earth and he was a Jew and all these different sects were all around him? Jesus rejected them all. Do you remember that? As Jesus grows up, does he go and join the Pharisees? No, he doesn't. Does he go and join the Sadducees? Did he go join the Essenes? Jesus rejects all of them and focuses on only being a faithful Jew. He rejects all these sects. Probably Matthew 23 is the place where we see Jesus' much hostility, or his most hostility, that he shows to these different sects. Uh, starting really in verse 6, it says that you have basically have these scribes and these Pharisees. He says, do what they say, but don't do what they do, because they're very hypocritical people. He says they love to go to the feast. They love to have the highest place. They love to go to the marketplaces and be called by men, Rabbi, Rabbi. But he says, but you do not be called Rabbi, for one is your teacher, the Christ. And you are all brethren. Do not call anyone on earth your father, for one is your father, he who is in heaven. And do not be called teachers, for one is your teacher, the Christ, but he who is greatest among you shall be your servant. Doesn't this look a lot like Ephesians 4? There's a oneness here, right? But not only that, in Matthew 23, Jesus is trying to tell us what the heart problem is in sectarianism, or I also believe in denominationalism. There's a heart problem here, and the heart problem lies in an authority problem. That there are men and women that want to use God's church to get ahead in this life. Not all members of denominations are like this, but there is several in the leadership that are. And if you think about it, in our system, in the way that we work as non-denominational Christians, is there any way to use Gardendale Church of Christ to get ahead? When you're a preacher at a church of Christ like this, how much is my authority? Y'all, my authority is non-existent. Anything I say, if I don't have a passage, y'all are going to fuss at me about that. The highest position you can have within God's local church is an eldership. As an eldership, is it a power trip or is it a life of service? It's a life of service. But what does a denomination allow you to do? It allows you to be part of an organization that's higher than the local church. It allows you to get ahead. And when you're governing multiple local churches, what do you got? You've got power. And you've got influence. And what do many of people like this love about denominations? It allows them to be called rabbi. It allows them to be called pastor. It allows them to be called the clergy. And now what you do is you have people that are in between you and God in terms of authority. 
that you actually have more authority than the average Christian. And we don't see that in Matthew 23. Matthew 23, Jesus says, you only have one authority, and guess what? It's me. And it's God the Father. And there's no one in between you and me. Evidently, I believe this is what Jesus is getting at. Is that secretarianism and as well denominationalism is a way for people who love power to take power. And this is why Jesus, I believe, never wanted it for his church. Let's use another example of the word sex used in, in Acts. When Paul is teaching, and when he's taken in Acts 24, the Jews there attempt to call Christianity a sect, a sect of Judaism. You see this in Acts 24, 5. He says, For if we found this man a plague, talking about Paul, a creator of dissension among the Jews through the world, the ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. Why does he say sect of the Nazarenes? Where was Jesus from? He was from Nazareth, right? So they were trying to call this Christianity the sect of the Nazarenes, and they say Paul's a ringleader in there. Look at what Paul says later in the chapter. Verse 14, But this I confess to you, that according to the way which they call a sect, so I worship the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and in the prophets. Did you catch that? I confess to you that according to the way which they call a sect, so I worship God of my fathers. Paul rejected the idea of Christianity being a sect. Was Christianity a small part of Judaism? Christianity was its whole new thing. And, and certainly, we wouldn't call Christianity a sect, and Paul and Jesus both reject that idea. Well, let's get basically just to the hard facts. I'm sorry my fonts didn't work up. They look beautiful on my computer. This first part says, is Christ good with a denominated church? Because I think that's the question we really need to ask. What is the Lord's will on what he wants his church to look like? Is Christ okay with a denominated church? Some say yes. And obviously that's why we're talking about this. And they will go to John 15 to defend that position. John 15, they'll say that basically what we see here is that Jesus is the vine and the denominations are all the different branches. And even though we all believe different things and practice different things, we're all still connected to Jesus, which makes us all still Christians. But let's read John 15 together and you tell me where you see the denomination churches. John 15, verse 5, I am the vine and you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit. For without me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is cast out of the branch and withered. And they gather and throw them into the fire and they are burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. But this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit so you will be my disciples. I think the next section is the kicker to all this. Verse 9, as the Father loved me, I also love you. Abide in my love if you keep my commandments. You will abide in my love. Just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Obviously, this passage is a command to keep the commandments of God. If you really love me, if you abide me, then you will obey my will. Does that make sense that we would all believe different things if the Lord only has one will? That doesn't make sense. Do you see churches in here? Do you see denominations in here? This passage is talking to individuals. You know what I saw a lot of? I saw a lot of me and you. Jesus is saying, if you want to abide in me, you need to do something. Who is the vine? The vine is Jesus. Who are the branches? The branches are you and me. As individuals, right? Simply Christians that are following the Lord Jesus. Just like we saw Jesus... Wanting to simply be a faithful Jew and be bound to the Father by keeping his commandments, like we see there at the end of verse 10. Let's explore this even deeper. What does this say? <laughs> does God want groups that do not believe the same thing? Does God want groups that do not believe the same thing? Because that's in the world that we live in, right? I think we can ask it like this Is Christ divided? That he has several different people all attached to him, but all believe different things. 
1 Corinthians 1 would be the passage where we would go to about this. Paul's talking about the divisions of just that local church, and he says, Now some say, each of you says, I am of Paul, I am Paulos, or I am of Cephas, or I am of Christ. And he asks the question, is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you, or were you baptized in the name of Paul? Paul's saying, don't put me in between you and Jesus. Jesus is the one who saves you. Jesus is the one you were baptized with. I'm just the person that introduced you. And so is Christ divided? Well, certainly not. And we see kind of a model here. Is this the type of church that God wants? Where he has a universal church made up of local churches that don't agree with each other or do not believe or practice the same things. Is this not Christ divided? I believe absolutely in that model Christ is divided. Because his people don't practice the same things at all. What we would have to do is we would have to change our way of thinking altogether. We would have to come at this and say, look, truth and error are different. Does our world believe this today? It, it's not just denominations that believe this. Almost the entire world that I know of believes this or doesn't believe this. They will argue with you that there is such a thing as multiple truths. And maybe if you've watched on TV or reality shows, you'll see people say stuff like this. What will they say? Well, that's just my truth, right? <laughs> That's just your truth. That's just my truth, right? That don't make any sense. One of us has got to be true and one of us got to be wrong. There's no making sense of a multiple truths. And I believe this is exactly what Peter is trying to teach us in 2 Peter chapter 1. Let's turn there. 2 Peter chapter 1. Peter here talking about his own memories of Jesus and the things that he bore witness to. It says in verse 19, And we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you well do to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation. What does he mean by that? He means you cannot privately have a belief that's different than mine, and we're both okay. No, there is only one interpretation of what God is saying, and that's the true interpretation. And it's not okay to have multiple interpretations of the same passage. He says in verse 21, this is why that's wrong. For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. That God, the Holy Spirit, is the one who inspired these things. And to disagree with the passage or to disagree with the apostles is to disagree with who? God, right? Let's go back up to the context to explain why he's using this. Look at verse 16. Peter says, For we do not follow cunningly devised fables when we may known to you the power and coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory to such a voice to him which is excellent glory. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And we heard this voice which came from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. What is Peter saying here in this context? He's saying anyone who disagrees with me about Jesus is wrong. Why is Peter able to boldly say this? Because Peter has the Holy Spirit, and Peter knows what he's saying is true. Meaning everything else is wrong. There's a couple scenarios we can go through. Is it possible, when we're talking about Scripture together and figuring out what God's will is in that Scripture, is it possible for you to be right and for me to be wrong? Yes, there is. Is it also possible for me to be right and you to be wrong? That's also possible. Is it possible for you and me to both be wrong? Yes, it is. Is it ever possible for me to be right and you to be right when we completely disagree about the passage? It is impossible. Why? Because there is no private interpretation of Scripture. It's logic. There is no way for all of us to be right when we all disagree. 
Now, some of y'all think about this and, and you question it. And I think you have a good reason to question it. Because the next thing I hear when we talk about this, and I think it's a reasonable question, then if it's... <laughs> If we all can't agree on the same things, but we need to because that's the only way we can all be in the truth, then why, Andrew, in this building right here, we all don't all agree about the same things? I believe there's a lot of things we agree on, but if I made a survey and I asked the right questions, I believe our survey would show that we all disagree on some things. How is that okay? I would never say it's okay. Or be satisfied with that. But I would say this. I can have fellowship with growth. I can be patient. And I can have fellowship with anyone. That has a reasonable scriptural argument for what they believe. If you think about this for just a second. Let me use an example. Of something that I've talked about last year. When I read and study the book of Revelation. I read and study it and teach it as it being primarily focused about the destruction of Jerusalem. Not everyone in this room agrees with me about that. I go to Revelation 17. I see the, set, the eighth comes from the seventh of the Roman emperors, and the eighth goes on to destruction. I see that as Titus. Titus is the one that destroyed Jerusalem. The book is about destruction of Jerusalem. But even though you and me don't agree about that, I'm not saying ever that we're both right. One of us is right, and one of us is wrong, or both of us could be wrong, Right? But I still can have fellowship with you because I believe that you're still being reasonable. And I still believe that you have a scriptural argument and you have Bible passages that you go to to understand your belief. And you know what? I can respect that. I can have fellowship with that. Because I see you as someone who's growing and learning and someone that only desires to obey the will of God. And I would expect you to show me that same common courtesy. That if you disagree with me, that you can say, okay, well, I disagree with Andrew. I don't think he's right at all. But you know what? I still think he's going to scriptures to prove his argument. And I still think he's being reasonable with his use of the scriptures. I can have fellowship with him. Because we all can have fellowship with growth. Well, then where do we draw the line? Why well, draw the line here? Man. The PowerPoint drew the line here, too. <laughs> I cannot have fellowship with rebellion. I cannot. I have never, ever heard a reasonable scriptural argument against baptism for remission of sins. I have never heard one. I'm still waiting. Because people will go to those passages and they'll come up with some of the strangest theories that are not reasonable and they will have no Bible passages to prove that baptism is not for remission of sins. I can't have fellowship with that. Because that's someone that's not willing to open their eyes to what God is saying after they've studied about it for a while. That's where I draw the line. But I always can have fellowship with growth. I can always have fellowship with people that are being reasonable and seeking out the scriptures as they're seeking out God. And that's where I would draw the line and be distinctive about this. To keep Christ's church united, let's kind of go through this quickly. And I believe this is what God intended with his universal church. We all have to agree that we seek the same authority. That we have one authority, and that authority is Christ and his apostles. Ephesians 1, 3, 5, and also in John 16 all speak about this. That Jesus and the apostles are the authority figures in the church universal. Anything they says goes. Anything they says is truth. And everything else is error. When the apostles and elders in the whole church send out a letter to correct the false doctrine in Acts 15. If you remember reading Acts 15, there's a lot of people there at this debate. You have a lot of Pharisees there. You have a lot of church members from there in Jerusalem. You have a few apostles and you have the inspired writer James. When Luke records Acts 15, he says that, you know, there were several people there. There was much dispute, but then Peter arose and addressed them all. And then, after talking about what Peter says, he focuses on what Paul says, and then he focuses on what James says. Why would he focus on Peter, Paul, and James in Acts 15? Because those are the holy apostles and the prophets. What anyone else said there in Acts 15, 
frankly, it did not matter. And it wasn't worthy to send out a letter to all the churches about what the false doctrine was about. When James writes this letter there at the end of Acts 15, he says, It doesn't seem not only good to us in verse 28, but it also seemed good to the Holy Spirit that we send you this letter. Right there is the authority. If the Holy Spirit agrees with Paul and Peter and James, then it is the truth. And that's why Luke focuses on them like this. As well, it takes personal responsibility to do this, doesn't it? The church is not a group of local churches. We see this in a few passages. This is the model that we've seen and talked about today. But Christ's church is not a group of local churches anyhow. The model is already functionally broken. The universal church is a group of people, isn't it? Look at 1 Corinthians 12 with me. 1 Corinthians 12. You see here that Paul is focusing not on the local church, but on the individual's. The body here is the body of Christ. It is the church. 1 Corinthians 12, 12. And for as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit we were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, have all been made to drink into the one spirit. There's one body, but there's many members. And even if you needed more evidence to see that as individuals, look at verse 13. He says the members of the body can be Jews, can be Greeks, can be slaves, can be free, but they're all in Christ. Is it possible for a local church to all be enslaved? <laughs> like, is a local church enslaved? Is a local church free? Is a local church Jew? It doesn't matter. No, people are Jews and Greeks enslaved and free, aren't they? And they are all individually members of the church. Look also down to verse 27. He says, Now you are the body of Christ and members individually. Right there, it's there. The universal church is made up of individuals. He goes on to describe those individuals in the next verse. And he says they're apostles and they're elders and they're teachers. People. The universal church is made up of people, isn't it? Being that the universal church is made up of people, whose responsibility is it to keep the church united? It's your responsibility. Philippians 2, Paul says to the people there, he says, Not so much more now when I was there, but in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Whose responsibility is it to obey the same authority to find truth and to keep Christ's universal church united. It is your responsibility. And it's my responsibility. The church here at Gardendale is simply a tool to help you meet that responsibility. Do we throw it off on the Gardendale Church of Christ? That's their responsibility. Do we throw it off on another organization? No, it's yours and my responsibility to obey the Lord and to follow the chief shepherd. Let's wrap things up very quickly with the local church. There is a local church, isn't there? And maybe the difference between the universal and the local is where maybe we have an issue. The local church is purposed to be a collection of members of the universal church. They work together to obey the commands of God. And God planned this out as we see throughout the New Testament. A simple example would be 1 Corinthians eleven eighteen. 18. He says, first of all, when you come together as a church, there's something they're supposed to do together, right? Well, could the universal church all come together in one place? Not here on this earth. But a local church can, right? The local church exists to help members of the universal church carry out the commandments of God. The local church is purposed to be overseen by elders. This is an authority position that we see described within the local church. These men are to serve over local church authority to oversee the flock among them. Not over there, not over there. Among the people that they worship with and the people that they serve. The Holy Spirit, by the way, is the one who made him elders. This wasn't something that men have gotten together and devised and came up with. This is something that the Holy Spirit approved and commanded. Paul says it like this in Acts 20, talking to the elders of Ephesus. He says, Therefore take heed to yourselves with all the flock, among whom the Holy Spirit has made you overseers, to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. The Holy Spirit has made you overseers. How is that? Well, I would suggest to you very simply it's this. The Holy Spirit makes them elders by presenting the qualifications. 
when a man is qualified by the qualifications that the Holy Spirit set forth, and he meets those qualifications and he is appointed to that position, the Holy Spirit made him an overseer. Because the Holy Spirit's authority is the one that allowed him to be the elder in the first place. I don't think there's something mystical about this. But I think we can confidently say that the men who serve as elders, because they are qualified, that they have been chosen by the Holy Spirit. We can say that. And we have a passage and a reason to say that. There's a reason why I wanted to go all the way around and end on this. Who is this all about? It's all about God. No God, no decision. No Holy Spirit, no elders. No Holy Spirit, no Christians. No Holy Spirit, we don't know what's right and wrong, what's left and right. Matthew 23, back there, what was the problem? You had men that wanted to be between men and God. But they had no authority to be there. That was a problem. What we can do is keep ourselves in our proper place and keep the Holy Spirit in his proper place. And we can serve God faithfully and humbly in righteousness. I think this is the model that we see. Thank you for your close attention. And I know that was a lot. And I know it was like drinking it through a fire hose. I know my PowerPoint didn't work. I know I'm sweating because I'm trying to finish. The good news is with all of this, Uh, and especially what's been going on this week, is I've lost a lot of weight. I've lost 20 pounds. I guess when they take your tonsils out, it's just the quickest way to lose weight possible. This suit is something Jeremy Burnett bought me in 2013 when I was here for the summer program. I have not been able to wear this suit since 2015. When I weighed myself this morning, I said, I know what suit I'm going to wear. I didn't want to finish today and do this sermon on something very logical and very straightforward and not address what I think was in a lot of people's hearts right now, which is a lot of people have had a very rough couple of weeks. I think we're all very mindful of the tornado in Nashville. We're mindful of the brethren that lost their lives and their baby. Many people I know aren't here today because uh, they're at the funeral that's happening today there in Nashville. I know a lot of people are worried about Mr. David. Uh, who's going into hospice care. I know people are worried about Al and Donna, and we're hoping and praying that Donna's treatment works. There's a lot of things that we're worried about. I know a lot of us are fighting with our homes because of the water. It just won't stop coming down. Um, there's just a lot of things going on. The past couple of weeks, Psalms 23 has been in my head. And I keep on repeating it to myself. The Lord is my shepherd... I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. For your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. When I was little, I used to think that passage, people would say that was their favorite passage, and I would make fun of them. I would think like, you're just picking that passage because that's the only one you know. There's tons of passages. But you experience some things and you live a little longer and you realize that that's a very good passage. If the Lord is our shepherd, that means we follow him and that means we obey him. Can we say the Lord is my shepherd? I haven't seen him for years. Can we say the Lord is my shepherd? I have never even met him before. When we obey the will of the Father, when we are a follower and disciple of Jesus Christ, That is when the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. What a wonderful shepherd we have. If there's any way we can assist you tonight or this morning for the Lord to be your shepherd, please come forward as we sing and sing.